is Jane Lowe and I'm at the Acronis office here in Singapore and today I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Kevin Reed, who is the CISO of Acronis, to tell us everything about Fala's malware. Very fascinating topic. It deserves a special session on it. So thank you so much for your time today, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so, uh, so tell us, what is Fala's malware and how different is it from traditional malware? Okay, so... There are, when we think about fileless malware, the main distinction of it is that there is no file on a disk to scan, which means that traditional anti-malware, traditional antiviruses, mm. um, they they don't have anything to look for uh, because there is no file. And traditional anti-malware mm. is what it does. It just searches the hard drive for suspicious files, and then uh, it tries to figure out whether a particular file is malware or not. And if there is no file, mm. then they are blind. So a very natural question then for our audience is, if there's no file to search, then what? how do we know there's a malware? That's a very good question. Um, so when you look at a system, you observe the outcomes, right? And if system misbehaves, mm. then you know that something is wrong with that. It uh, might be a bit late then. It might be a little bit late, but mm. uh, you will know at some point that, okay, all your files are encrypted suddenly, then you will know, okay, there was a ransomware. But That's right. indeed, it was too late. Uh, of course, it would be better to, to be able to uh, detect fileless malware mm. in advance. Uh, but before we talk about that, there are actually two different ways or different, yeah, different ways how it operates. Mm. And... One of them is an in-memory execution, mm -hmm. and the other one is what is called the living of the land technique. And so in-memory execution is that you actually have a malicious code. The malicious code, however, does not land on a disk. Mm. With living of the land, um, it's a set of techniques that are usually being used by malicious actors with the hands-on operations, so like not the malware that is deployed and runs autonomously, but there are really people on the keyboard that are like typing commands, uh, but they are not using malicious software. Instead, they are using utilities and tools that are available in the operating system itself, mm -hmm. but they are using them in a different way, in a malicious way. Mm -hmm. And so, again, the tools themselves are not malicious, yeah. so there is nothing to detect. Right, yes. So, of course, these tools are very common tools, as I understand. They could be sort of uh, the Windows uh, PowerShell system, for example, or the Windows uh, instrumentation, Windows management instrumentation systems. Um, so, using these uh, common tools that are necessary to operate a sy Windows systems anyway, this, it's very difficult to see whether there's a malicious behavior mm -hmm. going on, unless then, of course, you see that the system is locked up, then that, that's when you know there's the malware. Yeah, yeah, you correctly pointed out. Uh, the PowerShell is, is the biggest uh, living of the land technique. Using PowerShell is the biggest living of the land technique. And uh, malicious attackers uh, don't, malicious actors don't bring their malware with them. They instead make use of the existing PowerShell scripts and, and comments to achieve their malicious outcomes. And to give you an example of, uh, of such operation, so for example, there is a PowerShell command or CMD lad um, that allow uh, the user to download files from the internet. Uh, and uh, malicious actors can combine that utility with another one that would uh, get this data in memory decrypted mm -hmm and then start executing it. And so what happens in, in, in a real life situation is that you have a file somewhere on the internet. You download it, but it doesn't hit the disk, so it's not stored on the disk, it's still in memory. You decrypt it, it's still in memory. Mm -hmm. And then you pass the execution over to this decrypted code, and it's still in memory. So there's nothing at this point, mm -hmm. nothing had hit the disk. Uh, it's a very common technique. and. You're right, it is hard to detect. So what we do now with modern EDR system, systems, uh, we are trying to see what comments are being executed within PowerShell. 
So how PowerShell changes its state in mm -hmm. memory mm -hmm. as the time progresses. Right, right, okay. So you're really looking at the behavior. Um, I have two questions. So first is say that it's not a new technique. So I understand that fileless malware has been going around for what, more, is it more than 10 years? So it's Definitely not exactly more than 10 years. More yeah. than 10 years. And I think that the, one of the more popular ones is uh, in the WannaCry episode. Is yeah. That, is, well, am I right? Yeah, definitely WannaCry was uh, one of the examples, big ones, yeah. one of the examples. Uh, there was Stuxnet before that. Oh, that, that's right, of course, yes. That, that, that had uh, that uh, situation. But I think one of the first ones, and uh, the one that was very interesting from, from the execution techniques was SQL's Clamor. Okay. SQL Slammer was a self-propagating malware that was a worm mm -hmm. um, that the way how it worked, it, it sends itself in a single UDP packet, which was like 500 something bytes. I don't remember how long, but it was mm -hmm. really small. But that packet was enough to exploit Microsoft SQL Server. And the worm uh, exploited the server, and then together with the exploit, the worm sends its own body. And then this body uh, was executing in the memory of the target SQL server, again, without ever hitting a disk. Oh, wow, okay. And once it started executing on that server, mm -hmm. it started, it, it would be scanning the internet again for more servers, mm -hmm. and then each time it would find a SQL server, it would send a packet, Mm -hmm. transfer itself over there and start it on that target server. Okay. And so over the time, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, I think it was like every eight or 10 minutes, the total number of servers in the world doubled because of this scan. So it scans faster and faster and faster. So there was one, then there was two and three minutes, then four, eight, 16. And then mm -hmm. before you know, like the whole internet actually, that was about 15 years ago, I think. Is it 15? Yeah. Okay, so before WannaCry. Oh. It was before WannaCry. It hey. was before Stuxnet. So it must be more than 15 yeah, years. Yeah, it was okay. before Stuxnet, definitely. Um, it was very early in my career, one of the first large attacks. Uh, and uh, so it eventually led large portions of the internet mm. to halt. Mm -hmm. So it, it was just so, so much traffic Mm. that the routers were not able to perform its function. So that was detected only after the Ethernet uh, was... Uh, that is true. Some. So again, you observe the outcomes uh, mm. because there is nothing. And right. anti malware industry back then was not as developed as it is now. The EDR concept didn't exist mm. at all. So the only way how you would figure out that something is going on uh, would only be if you mm -hmm. realize that your server starts scanning the Internet for some reason. Okay, so another question that audience may ask is that it's not entirely, if we look at the anatomy of a sort of a cyber attack, mm -hmm. is it possible that the entire end to end is fileless? It's not possible, is it? Like the intrusion, the original intrusion has to be some form of a file, like a, um, phishing. Um, yes and no. I can think of an attack that would be entirely fileless. Wow. If you look at a WannaCry, okay. how WannaCry propagated. So WannaCry, if you remember, it exploited a vulnerability mm. in, uh, in SMB, that is a protocol that is used by Windows to transfer files um, and share printer jobs. So each Windows system has this SMB protocol mm -hmm. enabled. WannaCry attacked SMB protocol, and as it did so, it actually started the execution of a malicious core in memory of the target server or target workstation. Mm -hmm. And at that point, there was nothing written on a disk. Okay, so so the propagation itself mm -hmm. didn't require actually any file on a disk. The original intrusion is also fileless. The original intrusion is also fileless. So right, once okay. you have the code running there, in theory, you then can do anything you want, right? So you can, as I mentioned, you can download additional yeah. malware from the internet from somewhere if you need to. Um, into memory. Into okay. memory, directly into memory. And that is that is not easy technique, definitely, yeah. right? Uh, so I'm not saying that like it's available to uh, right. anyone. Right, you, you got to be a right? sophisticated hacker to do that. Uh, it is, it is. Like memory management is hard and uh, taking care of like 
any mistake you make while you're mm. running memory will lead to your process shutdown and you're mm. losing access as, a, as an attacker. So you have to, to be precise. Uh, but it is possible. So you have, you have your malicious code running in mm. memory. You download additional data or additional modules mm. uh, to maybe expand your access or to enable persistence. And then you can continue to operate without ever touching the disk. So WannaCry end-to-end -end is fallacious. Essentially, WannaCry, uh, I, I don't remember out of the top of my head, to be honest, whether mm. WannaCry was entirely fileless, but it is definitely possible to do it. 90% of it is definitely yeah. fileless. Wow, that sounds dangerous. So for our audience who are familiar with, you know, who are sitting at home, say, you know, uh, my parents, for example, sitting at home, very used to, you know, antivirus mm -hmm. sort of packages. What should they be worried? Okay, what should they what should they worry and what should yeah, they do? Yeah, yeah because what should they do? Obviously, some ransomware are followers, so should they should they be worried? Um, yes and no. Um, I think if you um, if you look on uh, a J average person, so mm -hmm. to say, like what what can they do? Um, and I think the the main answer is patch your systems. Make oh, sure, right. okay. make sure that your system is up to date and do not delay with uh, installing um, uh, patches. If you, again, if we look at the WannaCry case, uh, I left WannaCry so much because I was at Orchard Road when it started, <laughs> and I was walking down the orchard, um, <laughs> and I saw uh, in some retail shop. I don't remember what was that. I saw the blue screen, and and this. Uh, Encryption, uh, encryption node, and I made a photo of that because I thought, okay, that's it's not it's unusual, right? You didn't uh, think that it was real. Uh, well, I, I understood yeah. that it was real, but it was unusual, like to to see uh, this front booth of a of a retail store compromise, that's true, yeah, right? Online, uh, yeah. On, uh, and I thought, okay, yeah, that's rather unusual, and posted it on Twitter, and uh, I think a couple hours later that image was across the whole <laughs> wall because every like every other computer was infected and everyone had the same was, screen <laughs> had, had the same screen and I was thought okay that is that is bigger than I thought something's going on yeah yeah so going back like how did WannaCry uh, did its job mm. it did so it propagated by exploiting a vulnerability mm -hmm. that has been actually by that time patched by Microsoft so the organization, companies, uh, and individual users who have installed the patch by the time WannaCry started, mm. they were protected. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the biggest thing you can do mm. is, patch it, your is to patch your system. Yeah, great advice. Great advice. I think, yeah, so uh, thank you very much, Kevin, for sharing your insights on what is fileless malware and how it is different from traditional malware. And of course, your great advice, you know, patch the systems. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, any last words before we go? Well, that's your system. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, choose good passwords and use two-factor authentication. Great. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Thank, thank you, you for your time. Thank you very much.